So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Antica Chulina and um, welcome to the Sortie 2022nd conference. Uh, note that this session is being recorded and later it will be shared at our OSF uh, meeting platform. I think Ed will post the link into the chat. Before I introduce our plenary presenter, I have a few announcements that I need to make. Uh, please familiarize yourself with our code of conduct. Ed has posted it. Uh, for detailed information on all the events, uh, please check the conference information pack. Also, information about the conference is available at sortie.org events. Uh, this does not include the links to events. You can find the list of all Zoom links in the Google Sheet, which you can also find in the conference pack or in the Shiny app. And please keep these uh, to yourselves. And if somebody else wants to join, please ask them to, um, to, to uh, subscribe to the conference. Uh, some discussions are also happening on Slack. So you can join the Slack and also different channels on Slack. Um, we are obviously excited for this plenary and all the other plenaries and all the other events that are happening at the conference. Many of them are interactive. So you can participate in shaping more open, reliable, and transparent future for ecology and evolutionary biology. And we hope that you will find uh, one of or more of these events to attend. Now uh, about this plenary. Uh, first, uh, each of you can turn off uh, or on automatic captioning that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, we invite you to ask questions and answers uh, of uh, like using this Q&A function of the Zoom. And you can do that while the presentation is happening. Uh, and then you can upload some questions. Uh, so they come uh, um, like uh, more important on the list because I will then later use these to ask uh, our speaker. Uh, and then we'll have 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. And after that, uh, we will leave for a web, uh, this webinar and join to a regular Zoom meeting. Uh, Ed will post the link to that Zoom meeting and there we will like break into smaller groups and you will have the opportunity to also talk to Chiamo in these groups. Uh, remaining questions that haven't been addressed during the Q&A session can also be posted in the Slack channel that is dedicated to this plenary. So it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, uh, Chiamo Mosrega. Uh, he is a lecturer at the University of Botswana at the Department of uh, Computer Science, and he also leads high performance computing and data science research cluster there. But he is also an incoming director of the African Open Science Platform. And I feel like reading through his uh, bio that this really reflects uh, his large and long term experience. First, with uh, digital transformation, so all the digital transformation needs, and that's not only um, the, the the expertise in uh, these distributed systems that he has in computer science, but also in the engagement of very many different types of st stakeholders. And this is what I'm really excited about his talk that he will uh, give today, because I think we can all learn from it. We are all here researchers mostly, and we interact with other researchers. But I think Chiamo is going to bring this a level up. So how to actually engage a community that is larger than us? Because open science uh, is not just about researchers. It's about uh, funders. It's about um, uh, the, the government who has supported. So it has many different stakeholders. And I believe that Chiamo is going to show us the complexity of it and how to deal with all of this into breaking sciences and generally our society into something that's more open and thus more useful for everybody. So welcome Chiamo and uh, looking forward to your talk. Very much uh, Antika for, for the invitation and, and, and honestly for, for, for engaging to make sure that um, we have an opportunity in this platform uh, to share uh, some of the uh, things that are happening in the continent. I'm aware that this is a growing conference that has got a global footprint. Um, it being attended virtually also gives us obviously an opportunity to 
engage with uh, a myriad of stakeholders um, around the world. So I think really this is a conference that will uh, provide an opportunity in coming years and it will grow to, to, to really have a robust uh, network. Uh, for us at the African Open Science Platform, uh, we think it's very critical uh, to engage like this, uh, primarily because I think we want to build a network of networks. Um, as you rightly when you introduced us, uh, we are a network um, of, 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 of African institutions uh, that will be looking to, to have a platform, a platform that will not only solve African problems, but also contribute to uh, global challenges. So it really gives me great pleasure to be here today and to share some of the things that, that we are doing. Uh, perhaps I can maybe just turn off my video to preserve uh, bandwidth uh, in terms of uh, the connectivity that we may have problems with. So really, um, as, as, as the Master of Ceremonies is introduced, uh, I am the incoming director um, for the African Open Science Platform. Um, I've shared a few links already at the bottom there uh, regarding what the African Open Science Platform is. Uh, we interviewed recently with the International Science Council. Um, there is a blog about AOSP. Uh, there is also uh, a, 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 a few uh, news items that you can see uh, on, on the internet. But broadly speaking, um, there is a tantalizing prospect for developing a platform that is Pan-African wide. You already see on my first slide there uh, the various things that we'll be uh, focusing on uh, that are probably uh, applicable, obviously, to a lot of open science platforms around the world. So indeed, it will be very, very uh, opportune now and in the future to be able to see what others are doing. But we thought today we'll share with yourselves uh, what we are trying to do beside. The issue of policy that overarchs what we do, policy that will translate into strategies and implementation plans in and around open science is something that is critical. And you'll see in the presentation that this is indeed one of the elements uh, of the African Open Science Platform in terms of facilitating uh, development of supporting policy to, 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 to further these things. The issue of infrastructure, uh, very critical. And I'm sure in the, in, in the developing world, access to infrastructure is often a stumbling block. Often you have very competent, well-trained researchers uh, who are frustrated by lack of infrastructure. The issue of data in terms of maximizing the data that you have, uh, managing the data that you have, making it open uh, as much as possible uh, is critical. The issue of access to scientific literature uh, critical, the issue of skills, the issue of incentivizing stakeholders and institutions in looking to further open science. And then of course, the issue of collaborations, uh, which is what we're here for and the necessary partnership. So really that very first slide just really encapsulates the very essence of what are the elements of, of the, 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 the open science platform that we are trying to develop. And I always share this slide here, just to show us, uh, show stakeholders the, the complexity and the size of Africa. Um, uh, often it becomes vivid when you see the geographical scale. Uh, Africa really uh, is, is truly, truly big. So what that means is that there are a lot of challenges and opportunities uh, therein uh, presented by, by working at that scale. And indeed the African Union uh, has set out a very clear agenda, Agenda 2063, uh, that stipulate and postulate about the Africa we want, an Africa that will take uh, its place in the, in, the, in the table of nations um, in terms of being integrated, being prosperous uh, and being peaceful. But of course, there are a lot of things to unpack and, 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 and science, technology and innovation can also be used uh, to further this vision that uh, has been expounded at an African level. You'll see the pillars there. Um, the Agenda 2063 looks at the economic side of things, uh, looks at how Africa can engage in global challenges, and indeed um, appreciates uh, the rapid change happening in the continent. And you saw the scale of the continent. There are a number of facets uh, with all these pillars, and there are a number of challenges. And these challenges are multifaceted, and they're often interlinked, and they cross border. They are cross border, they transcend boundaries. And clearly they cannot be addressed by a single government single-handedly. And uh, the African Union uh, has developed also uh, mechanisms and instruments like the science and technology and innovation strategy uh, to really show how science uh, can be used to, to, to address some of these challenges. 
one of the key things also when you look closely in terms of um, uh, collaborations uh, in the continent, um, you will see that a lot can, can be done. Uh, collaboration is really a keystone of, of, of advancing how we do things, including in, in, in research science and technology. So I wanted to share with you there um, a, a picture. I'm sure you know a lot of parts of the world also are experiencing the same challenges. How can we move from having these sparse networks uh, of collaborations and intensify them? Because really, the core of, of collaboration is, is making inroads in some of the challenges that I that I showed, and often it's important to think about developing ecosystems, ecosystems that will allow us to, to address those challenges um, so that we have uh, 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 things in place uh, to assist. I'm sharing with you there a diagram that shows a cyber infrastructure ecosystem and its components. Uh, you will see there that at the very uh, uh, base, we have this connectivity, connectivity of, of institutions through, through networking. Uh, on top of that networking, obviously we can have um, can have computational resources, um, whether they be supercomputing resources or clouds or data centers, uh, that will be in the ecosystem. And of course, on top of these computational resources, one can think of how we can manage the data uh, in the ecosystem. Often you have very expensive instruments that uh, not every organization can singularly own. You may want to share such instruments, observation uh, equipment, scientific instruments, telescopes, you can share them in this ecosystem. And often also you've got very diverse expertise. When you are going to develop proposals for projects, often you're thinking, how can I reach out to more expertise beyond the little click of networks we have? Uh, so often we need to incorporate knowledge about the expertise we have in the ecosystem in there. And notwithstanding, we have to also connect our organizations, uh, including universities and otherwise. Often you can also uh, procure things together as a collective. So really what is needed, um, both at a national level or at a regional level, including at a continental level and globally, is maybe developing this ecosystem that we can interlink uh, to be able to jointly uh, work on challenges. And indeed, if you look at the trajectory of where things are going, there is this push towards developing um, global uh, open science clouds uh, indeed, these clouds uh, federated also help in us working together to address global challenges where we don't need to compete, but to collaborate. You look at you know, SDGs, you look at climate change, you look at infectious diseases, you look at the global disaster risk. These are challenges that need us to work together and developing a global open science cloud uh, will, will further uh, those objectives. And of course, different regions in the world are also looking to develop uh, their own open science clouds uh, to obviously uh, connect uh, to these uh, global dispensations. And I'm just citing there an example of the European Open Science Cloud, which is really an environment for hosting and processing uh, research data to support EU-wide uh, science collaborations. I'm sure the Europeans uh, in your audience uh, know very well about this, this particular initiative. And of course, during COVID, um, these platforms have shown to be very, very effective in helping us uh, become more productive. Uh, and indeed, one can ask what open science is, uh, and I'm aware that this is a, a conference that is looking at open science. So I wouldn't dwell too much on the nitty gritty, because I'm sure maybe we've already had uh, presentations on this. Uh, but you'll see there the, the, the elements of open science in terms of the taxonomy, uh, notwithstanding that really the key definition of open science has to uh, be the engagement of society uh, and the economy in research activities. No, gone are the days where the scientists will be the lone scientists working uh, by themselves in a lab with collaborators and occasionally publishing. We have to think about how our science uh, lends with society, starting from when we are formulating problems. So I think open science in a way is promoting this engagement. Uh, areas like citizen science, you know, core designing, uh, uh, core design and, and transdisciplinary research and the interface between research, development, and innovation. So I think this is very key uh, when, we, when we highlight what open science is. Of course, the elements of data are just one element, i.e. we have our data sets uh, are findable and accessible and, and, and linked, interoperable, et cetera, et cetera. And the issue of open access is also paramount. So really, I'm just sharing that with you if only to refresh your minds about what open science is. 
and there are many uh, motivations of why we need to, to, to pursue open science or to, to use it uh, as, 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 as a way of, of doing science in the 21st century going forward. Uh, and, and, the, and the motivations are varied. But at the very core, everybody agrees that it is very good scientific practice uh, to communicate evidence, um, if, if only for, for academic integrity, but also for the producibility of what we are doing. Um, and for efficiency, obviously. Why would you want to, to replicate when things are already there? And there's strong evidence to show that you know, open data practices have really transformed a lot of areas, in the genomics, um, astronomy. Um, these are areas where, where open data has really uh, done, 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 done a lot. Uh, and, and you'll see there the very last point, which I think is critical. You know, open data can foster innovation and accelerate scientific discovery, primarily really through the reuse of data within and outside the academic uh, system. I think that's that's a very very strong value proposition for why do open science. And and to cap it all, uh, UNESCO uh, at the UN level um, has developed uh, this UNESCO Open Science recommendations, um, starting with defining what open science is. And, and highlighting the imperatives uh, for countries and institutions and what they need to do uh, to really promote open science. So I really encourage stakeholders here uh, to look at those recommendations and, and see how within the institutions uh, they, are, they are pushing for the implementation. Uh, in Africa, um, there are forums where we discuss and engage these recommendations, uh, including recently at the Africa Regional a forum for sustainable development in the Africa Regional Science and Technology Innovation. And emanating from those um, dialogue forums was key messages um, to say, look, we need to operationalize uh, open science and international framework of open science. And I think this is key because if at that level, this, this is agreed, uh, it will really help with the modalities uh, of implementation, especially that governments will be buying into this, to this, to this, uh, to these messages. And indeed, coming out of that is the need to develop these platforms that we've just been talking about. And if we were to look at the potential uh, for open science uh, for Africa and any other continent for that matter, um, it is very clear uh, that they, there is a lot of motivations for us going this way. I've mentioned the issue of collaboration. It is open science to accentuate and, and increase our collaborative work through joint projects. Um, if you look at um, development of skills, in terms of shaping future generations of scientists. You look there that Africa is very young at the top right image, average age of 19, means that you got a, a large number of uh, young people coming through our universities in the big continent, as, as you saw earlier. Maybe this is a chance very early on uh, to really train them uh, on these best practices of open science and going over uh, in the future uh, as future scientists. And again, there are areas where, where open science in particular, for example, open data can also help with economic activities. If you look at uh, the issue of biodiversity, which is probably very relevant uh, to your conference um, through earth observation, uh, if you look at our oceans, if you look at our minerals um, that, that are done in the continent, there, there is great potential uh, in using open science principles to tell them what we do. And of course, there's already also cutting edge science, including discoveries that are emanating from the continent. So really I was just sharing that slide uh, to showcase the various areas uh, of opportunity uh, for Africa, also to help further and implement the different strategies and documents, uh, including the Agenda 2063 that I talked about. And I'm just sharing on this particular slide, um, uh, imperatives for Africa. Uh, in terms of what um, are the main things. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, like I indicated, it will be very critical for the continent to de develop um, research, science, and technology ecosystems that are fit for purpose. Uh, that can obviously solve continental challenges, but it can also contribute to global challenges. Um, what that means is that we can uh, move from, for example, working on, 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 on singular projects in the continent but expanding them to become programs. Uh, you foster a continental science and research agenda uh, through these platforms we create. Um, the second bullet there is about, you know, for Africa, again, it will be critical to promote the best practices I've shown earlier 
and also to accentuate the impact of science in society. We know the developmental challenges that the continent has. So really there's an opportunity there uh, to look at open science as providing this impetus uh, for transformation of scientific enterprise. And I mentioned the issue of policy development, the necessity to develop uh, interoperable uh, policies, policies that talk together uh, in helping uh, as, uh, develop, in helping develop solutions uh, for nation states. Often you have a policy uh, stack in a country that do not necessarily have interfaces. Look at the issue of data. You want to have policies that talk, for example, how we handle data across uh, various elements of, of the national policy stack. Uh, the issue of thinking about framing problems with society so that there's buy-in um, is also critical uh, for Africa, I would say. And the issue of citizen science, notwithstanding uh, the young population I just talked about. The issue of data, the elephant in the room, at different levels. If you look at um, getting governments closer to the people and national digital transformation uh, initiatives, the data is sitting on government uh, institutions can we do more to make that available uh, for research, for innovation, for development? Uh, the issue of data is critical. There's an exciting project called the Data Values Project uh, that is looking really to interrogate some of these issues, including looking at data as the route to inclusion and equity, um, looking at data that is well-governed, and really looking at data that powers sustainable and equitable development. So the data is a key issue for Africa and how we open it up uh, as much as we can uh, to be able to accentuate its impact. Uh, another pillar that I think is critical for the continent is the issue of open access, um, the democratizing uh, of science in terms of its accessibility, these new models of publishing uh, that allows uh, more and more uh, African scientists or scientists from the developing world to publish. And for, for us to shape the dialogue uh, and giving the debate uh, on open access. I'm sharing with you there an image of a very, very key decision by Lancet, um, you know, the big medical journal, to reject papers that don't, don't acknowledge uh, scientists uh, in the continent or in developing countries where most of this research is done. I think these key steps or key interventions can go a long way uh, in addressing some of the challenges you have. Um, there was a very good study um, that was done um, as a precursor uh, to the development of the African Open Science Platform that I'll talk about shortly. Uh, the study really was to look at the landscape in the continent, uh, particularly looking at the status in terms of capacities and activities in the continent um, across the dimensions that I've kind of uh, captured earlier. And I wanna share the, 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 the link with yourselves so that I can have a look at the document. And indeed the study highlighted a number of very, very significant activities albeit that most of them were happening in isolation. So a platform that allows us to work together across boundary will be very critical uh, to gel us uh, together, which is why beyond the study, there was a development of a strategy, um, an African open science strategy with very, very ambitious vision of um, really putting the African scientists at the cutting edge of contemporary data intensive science. Um, obviously as a fundamental resource for a modern society. Uh, this was critical. Uh, and of course, uh, the implications are that we need to look at a number of pillars. Uh, we mentioned the issue of the hard infrastructure, you know, the federated network of those computational resources and uh, the soft infrastructure in terms of you know, policies and best practices of research data management as a key pillar to be able to help achieve that, that goal. The issue of having a data science and AI institute, you know, spanning and embedded at our institutions, very critical. The data that is emanating from all these activities in terms of research, uh, where is it going to be hosted? How can it be exploited? And how can it be shared? We need a mechanism in terms of an institute with, 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 with obviously the necessary tools to be able to, to further that. And critically, the third point, what are those collaborative projects that have got a continental-wide uh, footprint that we can already work together on and to obviously increase the impact of those projects and also exercise those collaborative networks I talked about. That's a very key, key pillar uh, for the African Open Science Platform. And then the two networks there at the end. Can we develop a network 
for skills development and education in data and information. So they can also maximize uh, the interventions uh, through this network. And then the very last network there, can you develop an open access and uh, 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 an open science dialogue platform? So for example, we can formulate and get to know each other in the continent and elsewhere uh, regarding challenges that we want to solve through open science and have a platform and network that allows us to, to be able to dialogue. So those were the five key pillars of that strategy. And in terms of the operational model for the strategy, uh, the, 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 the template is that there will be a coordinating hub for African open science platform, and there will be regional nodes at the various uh, regions in the continent, as big as you saw the continent. So that within these regional nodes, these these regions, the nodes will perpetuate uh, the, the, the different aspects of, of, of African Open Science Platform. There will be a call out soon for expression of interest by institutions from those regions uh, to look at proposing which of those pillars that I've just highlighted there, they want to lead in so much as uh, each of the nodes then will have cross fertilization with the other nodes in terms of uh, uh, perpetuating uh, impact of what they do. So really that is the strategy and how it's going to be uh, uh, implemented vis-a-vis -vis, uh, all those pillars there. And then again, the, a critical issue uh, for the African Open Science Platform is really providing the value proposition. Why should an institution, why should a government, why should a funder, uh, why should the private sector uh, or a research or society be want to be part of this? So we develop a very strong value proposition for all the stakeholders that you see there and uh, uh, unpacking what uh, ASP will offer. And I think this is a very important uh, thing to do. And we will be very, very keen to see what other platforms uh, globally uh, are doing in terms of their value proposition and in terms of how they're engaging uh, their stakeholders. Uh, for example, I mentioned there the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations. And I think it will be very critical uh, for us and other platforms to provide direction uh, in promoting and adopting uh, open science best practices. So you see that in our service, in our offerings there, we've unpacked uh, a great deal of what we need to do and to who uh, and to what end. And I think it'll be very critical also uh, to capture the benefits um, to the stakeholders, again, uh, across uh, the various stakeholders. You know, governments are, are, are very keen in development of these interoperable policy frameworks. And often there's no guidelines. Uh, everybody's starting from scratch. It would be useful to have guidelines to that end. And institutions are worried about the data uh, that is emanating from their research. Um, no one has to provide a, a motivation and for them. So again, this is an important element that uh, open science platforms need to, to, to be looking at. The donors, the funders, they want to have more impact for every, 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 every dollar, every pound, every dollar, every rand, whatever currency they put in uh, as investment. Um, so a value proposition to them is that your funding uh, will be able to, to reach more uh, stakeholders. Your funding will have more impact on a very large continent like Africa. And then of course, uh, our value proposition talks about uh, how we are going to deliver on our mandate. Um, how can we partner, how can you partner with us? Uh, and of course, we have a, a sustainability approach uh, that has got uh, many facets to. So I thought I'll share this slide with the stakeholders here, also to appreciate what goes into a value proposition for, for a platform like ours. And then in terms of its implementations, I mentioned the regional nodes. Um, it was very critical and it is critical uh, to align uh, what the African Open Science Platform is doing with what is happening in the different regions of the continent. You saw the four, five, six regions. And I'm giving you an example there of a region in Southern Africa composing of 10, 14 countries um, that are also talking about regional integration. And they are sharing uh, some policies at the regional level. They have strategies across the areas that they want to, to engage. And uh, one of the things that uh, they did recently for the past 10 years is development of that cyber infrastructure that I showed you in terms of a blueprint for it. Uh, and you'll see very shortly how that is being implemented. But we'll argue that initiatives like that um, have resonance with the African Open Science Platform. And the Op African Open Science Platform has to interrogate all the regions and see what activities are, are happening uh, in terms of uh, aligned uh, initiatives. I'm mentioning the SADC uh, CI, Cyber Infrastructure Framework, but there was a very exciting initiative that was meant to help 
universities, more often than not universities in the continent do not have resources to procure these computational resources I've talked about. You look at a typical African university, um, they do not have a data center or they do not have a high performance computing facilities to help their bioinformatics people, their computational fluid dynamics, uh, their mathematics modelers. Um, often everybody's working off of their laptops and desktops. How nice would it be uh, to have a little facility uh, that is beefed up in terms of computational power, allowing them to do that. So it's a very exciting project to work with partners uh, in, in Europe and in US uh, to get um, some equipment, uh, albeit that these are decommissioned machines, but still very, very good. Um, uh, three, four years old, every, kind, every of these institutions, they refresh their hardware. Uh, so we managed to have partnerships to bring this hardware and provision these systems in a number of countries in the region, uh, work with capacity building partners to train uh, the stakeholders on this. And this was very exciting. They created ecosystems uh, of researchers around them. Um, if you go further in West Africa, now that I've given you an example of initiative in Southern Africa, there are other initiatives, including LibSense, which is the library support for embedded endurance services. The endurance are national research and education networks. Uh, beyond connectivity, they need to do more. So LibSense is looking to, to engage uh, stakeholders uh, uh, in, in, in on top of the endurance uh, uh, to provide more services. And so I'm providing a, a slide there to highlight what they are currently doing. They are looking to have interventions in infrastructure, particularly uh, things like HPC that I've just showed that the SADC people were doing, identity management, the repositories, data repositories, which are critical. And they're looking also to shape the policy landscape uh, by facilitating development of policies. And they're doing a lot of capacity building. So really, this is another example of activity happening in another region that the African Open Science Platform uh, is linking to. And then if you go down to the national level, from the regional level, you go down to the national level, countries also need to be doing things to position themselves uh, to be effective in, in, in implementation of uh, the various things we talked about. At an AU level, at an African level, there's this development uh, around digital transformation strategies. Uh, one was launched in 2020. Uh, at, the, at the regional level, there's also development of, of, of digital transformation strategies. But at national level, Countries need to develop these strategies to enable what I've just shown there. So I'm giving an example of a Botswana. Um, other Southern African countries are doing the same in terms of, of an initiative for digital transformation, which talks to a number of things, uh, including uh, relevant things to, 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 to open science. So I think it's critical uh, for countries to be able to share these experiences. Uh, and indeed, at the end of this year, there will be a conference uh, in Botswana uh, as part of the, 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 the Southern and Eastern African endurance uh, regarding uh, uh, what they are doing. So I've, I'm putting that in there to showcase that it's very, very important at the national level to be able to do things. Uh, such an initiative, for example, has helped uh, countries then push to develop connectivity. Again, in the case of Botswana, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a development to create a new endurance that connects our institutions. Uh, Botswana is huge, it's the size of France. Uh, you'll see there that there's very good backbone network. And now that there's backbone network, they need to do the last mile connectivity. And through a European uh, collaboration to Africa Connect, um, that is also uh, engaging uh, Eastern and African, Southern African uh, institutions that we are having connectivity. The slide there just shows how we progressed to where we are with AOSP. Uh, moving on from 2022, as I mentioned, um, the implementation phase for all these things I'm talking about will be starting in earnest. And so I was very keen to come to this forum to be able to share this with you. And in terms of stakeholders here, seeing uh, potential avenues for engagement. And these are some of the things that we'll need to unpack um, as, we, as we move uh, with the implementation. And I'm sure uh, other open science platforms that are here uh, are familiar with some of the elements that governance, for example, is critical. How do we direct and govern uh, at these platforms? the issue of resource mobilization. How do we together as a network um, mobilize resources uh, and, and how do we implement all those pillars that I shared earlier? So I really wanted to share very, very quickly um, an update of what we are trying to do, if only to, to, to show that AOSP is here. Um, we are currently doing a gap analysis to augment the landscape study that I've shown and um, to see what's now happening since the last update. 
We are also positioning ourselves in terms of visibility. You can visit our portal um, to see what we are doing. We've contributed to the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations to give an African perspective. And we're engaging in conferences like yourselves uh, to be able to share what we are doing. I think this is very, very critical. Um, we are very keen on developing an ME framework, an African Open Science Platform Monitoring Evaluation Framework. Critical to develop the open science indicators so that we can measure uh, what, what the impact of what we are doing is and what has been, what's been done through open science. We are contributing to the African uh, Science and Technology Observatory indicators um, to be able to lead uh, uh, that initiative regarding open science. And shortly we'll be uh, setting out a, a call for the establishment of the regional nodes I talked about. Uh, and of course, uh, that will be a process uh, that, that engages uh, the, 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 the network uh, around the, the continent. Uh, we are also, uh, will be at the end of the year, setting up a governing council um, that will be emanating from the strong membership uh, that, that, that will be uh, garnering uh, from the continent. And we are working very hard in terms of our resource mobilization uh, with various stakeholders uh, through the value proposition that I shared. And one of the key things that we are also doing is really engaging and leveraging the different networks in the continent and supporting policy development. Uh, most countries now looking at the UNESCO Open Science recommendations, also looking at their internal uh, priorities. They are developing these open science policies to guide uh, implementation. On open access, we are also engaging the International Science Council uh, on the opening uh, the scientific record initiative. And we are working and engaging publishers on how best to make uh, scientific publications uh, affordable for the continent. On the issue of open data, we are working to uh, formulate a, 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 a blueprint for our, for our data uh, science institute. Um, and that will be very, very critical. We are talking to a number of partners uh, as we speak. And then the training, um, continental-wide training, we are engaging core data and RDA data science uh, schools who have a very, very good curricula that is uh, evolved over a number of years. Another very critical pillar, uh, as you saw earlier, is the issue of projects. We will need projects really to get us to work together. And I've mentioned on a global level, a project that we can collaborate on. And we'll agree uh, that areas like weather and climate uh, and global change are critical. So that slide there just shows you, uh, for example, in terms of the, 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 the global risks in terms of climate change. Uh, potential for, for the continent to engage, but also potential for the continent to engage uh, uh, the rest of the world. And of course, the challenges associated with that. The issue of research infrastructure uh, needs to be sorted out. The issue of observations in the continent, uh, the limited uh, observations that emanating from the continent, the issue of limited computational infrastructure is also key. The issue of skills, uh, both in data science and, 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 and otherwise. So again, this is a potential area where we can formulate projects in the continent uh, to be able to get us to work together. Uh, and I'm giving an example of such a project. There's a very exciting project happening in Southern Africa for the past three, four years, uh, looking at you know, multi-hazard early warning systems, uh, looking at uh, those areas, observations, modeling, and dissemination. And most importantly, already good publications are coming out of it. And then on the top right, you'll see an initiative in South Africa regarding their atlas that they're developing for vulnerability, again, related to those global risks that I showed earlier. And it's important to have these platforms um, and there's a potential for this to also scale uh, to, to the continent wide. And perhaps maybe relevant to your stakeholders here is in the area of biodiversity. Um, there's an exciting project that I saw happen to be involved in, um, in uh, developing a biodiversity repository for the Okobango. Okobango, as you know, is one of the World Heritage Sites. You can see there the picture at the top right. You can see it from space. It's one of the very few inland deltas. A river dissipates into the desert of the Kalahari without getting to the ocean, creating a tapestry of uh, ecology and, 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 and biodiversity. And documenting the information about the species uh, and that environment is very critical. So there's uh, a, a, an ongoing project uh, with the JRS uh, Biodiversity Foundation that is looking to help uh, with that uh, repository. There's also good work done by the South African uh, Environmental Observation Network 
Um, they got a catalog that you can also visit um, for biodiversity. And I mention this because on a continental scale, this can also be scaled up uh, to provide uh, continental-wide information. Uh, in genomics, I've mentioned genomics as one of the areas. There's a new project starting to run this year on developing a genomics platform uh, for the genomics community. Um, um, we we'll provide obviously the infrastructure, uh, the data uh, repositories uh, and the tools and the capacity building. And again, this is a Africa-wide uh, scalable project that can also uh, obviously uh, do a lot of uh, uh, good in terms of perpetuating open science uh, practices. In chemistry regarding renewable energy, there's also projects potentially uh, that can also scale uh, to a continental uh, wide project. The issue of renewable energy, as you know, uh, is a critical one. Development of catalysts, biomass uh, for this, development of uh, efficient solar cell materials. We know that these are critical areas for developing countries. Uh, the issue of space sciences, uh, exciting potential for space sciences, Earth observation. Most countries in the continent uh, are developing space science policies, and indeed, uh, Africa has got the uh, Africa-wide uh, space agency, and there's potential really uh, for, for, for projects that we can work together on. Uh, as I wrap up, there's also in the space sciences development of a, a regional uh, space science technology strategy um, at a regional level in Southern Africa. And through the prism of this strategy, we can develop projects uh, accordingly. So Master of Ceremonies, um, thank you for allowing me to expand in great detail uh, our plans um, and our ongoing plans um, and, and those elements that I've highlighted to show areas where indeed stakeholders here can see how they can engage us. Uh, in summary, um, I want to highlight that really uh, platforms like ASP and others you know, present an opportunity for us to advance open science in our continents uh, and, and further those uh, objectives and impacts, including uh, uh, through collaborations. Um, we want as a continent to develop and, and, and contribute uh, to, to, to challenges uh, in, 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 the, in the globe uh, through joint action. So we need to develop a global commons. Uh, we want to drive the UNESCO Open Science recommendations and help uh, the conversation, help drive the conversations nationally, regionally and internationally on how these recommendations can be implemented. And we also want to support activities on open science across the continent. And we are very, very keen uh, to make sure that we learn um, what we are doing good and how we can improve through an m &E framework. How can we measure the impact of open science in society? We need to have those indicators. We need to have an observatory that allows us to do this. And we can only succeed with all this if we take a pragmatic approach. Uh, there's no shortage of pipe dreams, uh, lofty dreams that have never been implemented. We need to be pragmatic about what we do. Start small, start with those areas that we can, we can, we can, we can, have, we can push, and also have a network of funders, create those little networks and learn as we go along uh, so that we can grow this. And I wanted just to highlight this uh, to show that already uh, there is some traction in terms of key initiatives that I shown earlier. And there's some support initially from the International Science Council and uh, the coordinating hub of AOSP uh, based in South Africa. South Africa managed to bid and win to host this for the next five years. Beyond that, this thing will rotate in terms of coordination across the continent, but there will be those nodes that we saw earlier uh, in terms of perpetuating open science practices uh, in the continent. Um, and then I want to share some contacts. Dr. Mchun is here. Is the deputy director of ASP. She's our contact person regarding inquiries. Uh, colleagues, feel free to visit our website uh, and send inquiries, especially for potential collaborations uh, to us so that we can, we can uh, further uh, our objectives and, and, and collectively uh, develop a platform that is fit for purpose. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tiamo. That was really interesting talk. And I like how you nicely represented the breadth of actions that need to be taken and also the complexity of the systems and actions and stakeholders that need to be involved in this kind of uh, transition to, um, well, digital transition that's also related to open science transition. 
uh, as well as these real life examples of implementation on, of, of achieving such a network on these kind of uh, examples that you um, have shown us. So thank you a lot. And um, I would like to take any questions from the audience. There is a Q&A um, option on the Zoom, so you can post your question there. That is the best way for us to see your question. And uh, maybe before I read questions from others, I have one myself. Uh, so when we talk about open and also, for example, when we talk about fair data, uh, we say open, but um, I find it very difficult to understand to whom, because if you have a very specialized work or area of science, then obviously it can't be made open to a general public in the sense that it can be made open and understandable to a specialist from that area. So when you develop these kind of open practices, uh, where do you see the, the border, like how, how open, can they really be open to everybody in sense of understanding the data, for example, or understanding the open procedures? So how do you see this openness as a term? Does it depend on no, the uh, receiver? No, that's a very important uh, question, Antika. Uh, I gave you an example of the biodiversity platform that is being developed for the Kobango Delta. Um, I think all these things starts with engaging your stakeholders. Um, the process that was followed for that particular project was to engage, for example, uh, the relevant ministries uh, in the country and to engage uh, the community at large to describe the needs, baseline needs uh, for such a platform. And then again, like you rightly said, to describe the data that you are going to, to store and then to describe access uh, to the data in terms of the different views, who needs what and who can see what. So at the very, in a general term, in a general way, uh, one can look at openness as degrees of openness. But the principle is open up as much as you can and close as necessary. And within that uh, uh, boundaries, you can decide uh, 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 what, what, what to do. Uh, there's also uh, 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 different definitions of, of um, access levels that you can also look. If you look at some, 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 some data repositories for every data set that is provided, there's also maybe some sort of uh, uh, license, creative commons license to say, you know, how open is this thing? How can you use this data set? So, so it's not like cut blanche, just open up everything. It's also a question of degree of how much you want to, as a community, you can decide when you're developing a repository. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's a bit of a tension there, especially for example of intellectual property. Uh, you find that uh, in some countries there's got intellectual property laws. Uh, you've got to be able to balance uh, uh, those plus uh, what you are doing. But in general, the principle is publicly funded research uh, produces data that, that are of uh, public interests uh, to many stakeholders um, and donors as well can 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 in a way influence. Uh, how we are sharing and disseminating the data that we have. So really, your question is loaded, but the principle is um, where possible, uh, let's open up and where necessary, we close. And we can also uh, highlight how we provide ac different access levels for this infrastructure that we develop uh, 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 and limit maybe, for example, certain data sets. For example, it could be that you had various stages of your research. Maybe you are not uh, ready yet to open up everything that you are you are doing as an intermediary product, but you want to maybe open up some things. So you can make judgments uh, uh, about some of these things. So there are some very, very good uh, guidelines uh, in terms of uh, open data, fair principles um, that I can also share with, with, with your stakeholders here. Uh, so they can really not be spooked by this notion of, of openness. Again, when you talk about government data, you know, government officials are always also very spooked about this notion. Um, so it's good to be able to address challenges like the one you are raising, articulate them very well. That really is a question of judgment uh, What when you decide what to open. I hope that answers partly at least your question. Yes, yeah, Tiamo, also just to take on to what you're saying that previously the architecture, this is uh, before everybody, this is Knox also from the Open Science Platform. So the architecture, before it was like 
is you have this envisioned ideal world where all the data is open, but what we've seen also is that different research communities have their own idea how data should be preserved and how they could access and use the data. So it's becoming more and clear and clearer that the architecture, yes, the overall interoperability uh, should be there, but each uh, a community will kind of have some certain substandard rules that they will uh, make under this open science and then it's then better for them to access, for example, communities as I would use I in bioinformatics have a little bit different architecture than people in, in climate uh, research. So you, should, you will eventually have this subsections of, of, of this open data, open access kind of like being also um, architect or built up around communities that use up uh, that type of data, but we should also acknowledge that as we moving on more more research or data is more multidisciplinary than just for for specific type of research. Thank you for the answers. Now we have a question. Can you please tell us more about the potential of this uh, database uh, Africa based peer reviewers. This sounds really interesting. That, that, that's a very good one. Um, I'll answer it, maybe also not to chip in. I think, remember, one of the key areas for open science is also open peer review, you know, the scientific review process. Um, so there's element of open peer review. Um, so really, it's critical when you are doing uh, peer reviews to be able to obviously, obviously have, 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 have reviewers that you can engage. So I think the idea is to be able to develop a database of such reviewers uh, so that you can create a, a resource pool uh, in terms of, of, of peer review. Nox, you also want to chip in on, on that one? Yes, there's, a, there's some projects, especially with uh, certain communities in open access, well, when we talk open access to open access per se, uh, not paid open access. So. It is uh, more or less what we've seen is that although that South African scientists seem not contributing, but as we all have seen, there's some internal bias in the publication space. So if we can have proper, as, as Tiamo had said, proper review system or double blind type of systems, and also more what we call what they're trying to work on, on report repositories that can also have pre-publication prints if they don't mind doing that. So this is a type of two things that have been being pushed in the African continent and the, the African uh, Open Science Platform is trying to make a big role with the Association for Universities of Africa when we're talking to the universities and, and, and the research performing um, institutes. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question. <clears throat> what is the role of incentives? So the values you showed funding uh, in making the transition to open science or will it need legislation and policy? So are incentives enough or do we need something extra? No, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pertinent question, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the definition of open science, intrinsic and implicit in the definition that there's need for a culture change, isn't it? You need to change how we do things uh, at various levels. Question is, how do you induce that culture change and how do you promote it? And you are phrasing it well. The question uh, phrases it well. What are the modalities and how can you best approach it? If you look at the university, for example, how can you get more of your researchers to embrace, to embrace open science practices? How can you get them, for example, to open up their data sets vis-a-vis -vis, uh, keeping their own data to themselves um, maybe till very, very late after they publish. How do you incentivize them, for example, to be able to open up the, the, the workflows or the scripts if they were doing analytics to be able to share that with others? And there are many different incentive schemes. Uh, it doesn't have to be coercion. Uh, it could be that you can maybe, for example, raise the profile of those who share more. It could be that the data sets that they produce are also citable in terms of having you know, unique DOIs, and they can also uh, be cited and, and contribute to their citation index. Uh, question is at different levels, whether it's an institution regarding your, your research 
uh, strategies? How do you promote and encourage behaviors that promote open science? Um, whether you can legislate it is arguable, but I would argue it's probably more to incentivize uh, uh, by, by changing the culture from within, uh, promoting and encouraging and, 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 and rewarding uh, researchers uh, who promote open science. And this is something that will take time uh, because it's not just your institution, but it's also the science system as a whole. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, citing data as much as you can cite papers and, and it is viable, valuable to your, to your, to your, to your promotion um, or contribute to your promotion as a scientist yeah. in your communities is another issue. So, so, so those are things that needs to be unpacked. Um, what we want is an incentive schemes framework uh, that we need to put in place uh, together with stakeholders and, and help push for that culture change uh, across the board. That, that's, that will be my response on that one. Thank you. And then we will allow one more question here and then we will go into um, a Zoom meeting. Uh, where we will discuss things in smaller groups, so it's more informal. And I think Ed will post the link into the chat here. Uh, and the last question is, um, I'm wondering if there are aspects of open research that can be seen as problematic, uh, that could create some disadvantages for researchers in Africa. Yeah, another, another great question. Uh, you had earlier uh, when I said in terms of the challenge that you have, um, lack of infrastructure, um, et cetera, et cetera. And our research ecosystems are also still, uh, it's, uh, still growing, still improving. Um, the efficiency and effectiveness of, of our researchers can also improve. So sometimes the worry is that when you open up your data, you'll have obviously um, in a way, exposing your crown jewels, early, so to say. Uh, your research agenda could be picked up by others and they can run away with it and um, publish maybe before you do. So, so I think those are one of the challenges that are you ready to open up and collaborate in equal terms uh, with those advanced uh, science ecosystems? And what do we have in place to make sure that uh, we can engage? You saw the example I gave you about Lancet uh, in terms of making sure that publications coming from the continent uh, do acknowledge research that are here. Those are the challenges. And there's no shortage of examples, whether it's research in Ebola uh, in West Africa, where you have uh, stakeholders from all over the world doing research. And when it comes to publications, Africans are not there. Uh, there's no shortage of examples of a meteorite falling on the continent before you know it. Um, specialists are coming from all over, pick up the meteorite, and before you know it, it's, 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 uh, it's assessed and, and, and looked at in a lab in, in Switzerland and there's no African collaborator. So really these are some of the challenges. Uh, and indeed, I think the solution is, is growing our ecosystems to an extent where we can also have an ecosystem fit for purpose to allow us, our scientists to collaborate in equal terms. Thank you, Tiamo, once more for the great talk and also for the answers to these questions. So now please, uh, join that link, click that link. Uh, we will also transition to um, this. So it might take a bit till we're all there, but bear with us and join as soon as you can. Uh, so we can facilitate uh, like breakout into these breakout groups. Thank you and see you soon.